Uh, so I'm absolutely delighted to next be joined by Chris Garrard, who is a co-director at Culture Unstained. And we're going to be talking about uh, the campaign to get cultural institutions to end their sponsorship arrangements with the fossil fuel industry. But before we get into any of that, Chris, it's an absolute pleasure. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? Good. A little tired, a little stressed. It's always a bit busy <laughs> on these days, but uh, yeah. we're getting there. Um so to kick us off, uh, nice and straightforward, could you talk us through why Culture and Unstained targets cultural institutions to end their sponsorship with fossil fuels? Sure. Um, so the campaign to like end fossil fuel sponsorship of cultural spaces, be it museums, galleries, theatres, and so on, um, has been around for quite a long time. There are other organisations that were, were doing it before us, but the I guess the main reason for doing it is cultural sponsorship by the fossil fuel industry is not philanthropy in the way that we sometimes think of it. They are not giving money to the arts and culture sector out of the goodness of their heart. It's a very calculated strategy to try and make their brands look acceptable, that they are these kind of generous supporters of the arts. And so basically when we encounter a BP or a Shell logo rather than associating them with climate impacts or the impacts of fossil fuel extraction on, on sort of frontline communities. We instead are associating them with being this kind of responsible cultural sponsor that cares about society and its future um, when nothing could be further from the truth. And it's, it's much cheaper and much more affordable to, to give your loose change as a fossil fuel company to the art sector to try and associate yourself with these progressive values rather than do the hard work of working out how you're going to transition away from fossil fuels and, and actually behave responsibly as a, as a company as well. Um, I guess the, the other piece of it, so that on, on the one hand, it operates a bit like a form of cheap advertising, I suppose. And we in the past, we had this shift away from tobacco companies sponsoring the arts as well. So again, companies that had a major image problem um, when there was scientific evidence about the impacts of their products, they deceived, spread disinformation, very similar to the fossil fuel industry there as well. So it's coming out of the same kind of playbook. But the other thing that happens in some cultural spaces is when you sponsor somewhere, you get to use the galleries or uh, the kind of theatres or the foyers and so on for your own private events. Um, so before an opera, you might invite along some politicians or policymakers. And it's, it's probably a bit easier to kind of shore up those relationships with a a kind of key politician over a glass of wine at the opera than in those kind of more formal meetings and government spaces where it's a little bit more accountable. So those kind of soft power kind of cultural spaces can really help these fossil fuel companies to keep drilling and further their business plans as well. So that's, that's sort of the, the overview of yeah, why, why we need to challenge them, why we need to expose what's really behind these sponsorship deals. That's a helpful summary. So I guess one of the uh, I guess, um, arguments that someone might put to you is that, well, that's all well and good, but we have a crisis of arts funding in the UK with cultural institutions strapped for cash. Um, is, is it not the case that when you've got sponsorship agreements with companies like this, that that, that enables those institutions to exist and to flourish and to, to finance the arts sector? Yeah, it's a really great question. And it, I mean, it's, one that we're, we're sort of responding to often. So I guess the first point is the amount of funding that will come from these major polluting companies is actually proportionally very small. So it's somewhere uh, like the British Museum, uh, which has had this long-standing sponsorship deal with BP, you know, based on the information we have access to, it's around half a percent or even less than that. Um, of the museum's overall income that comes from BP. So when they sort of say, oh, we rely on a BP or a Shell in order to deliver what we do and keep the doors open, that's actually really misleading because the core funding is coming from the taxpayer, other sources, other kind of potentially more uh, kind of ethical or acceptable corporate sponsors as well. So we don't rely on that fossil fuel money in the way it seems. Um, I guess the other piece of it is yes, there is a real challenge for funding in the art sector at the moment, that's long been the case. Um, but I guess one of the things we would point to is the, the kind of tax breaks and the subsidies and, and that uh, kind of piece that means the fossil fuel companies are essentially giving this kind of loose change again to help boost their image. Whereas actually if we were taxing them more effectively, we would have more money coming into the treasury, 
that could sustain arts funding to a much better level. Um, we we sort of did an infographic about five or six years ago just to illustrate the, the kind of difference in scale of like what the tax breaks and incentives to the North Sea were like, and it was far outstripping anything these companies were giving back to the arts sector as well. So again, it really showed that this was a form of kind of brand management and cheap advertising for them as well. So quite recently, you've had a pretty substantial victory, which is uh, that the Royal Opera House has ended its sponsorship arrangements with BP, which I think was in place for over three decades. Mm. Uh, how did you get that victory? So the Royal Opera House, the British Museum, the National Portrait Gallery and the Royal Shakespeare Company, um, back in, well, it was back in 2016, it was announced they were signing up to a, a five year sponsorship deal with BP. And that that kicked off in 2018. So they announced it a few years ahead. And, and that had become the pattern because by grouping them together in this way, BP could kind of big itself up as this big uh, kind of cultural sponsor. And there are, so, I mean, I work for Culture and Stain, but there are all these various other groups that make up the Art Not Oil Coalition secrets like BP or Not BP, Liberate Tate, Shell Out Sounds, Platform, goes on, um, who kind of, work in collaboration, but a lot of the activism was using these creative protest tactics um, and they were being sort of dispensed across these different cultural institutions, challenging their BP sponsorships. And so specifically at the Royal Opera House, which was in some ways quite, quite surprising that it shifted um, because that relationship was so entrenched. But over the years there had been protests popping up inside the opera house during the interval so again not disrupting the opera itself but trying to raise those issues in that space um, and the particular thing that BP sponsored was the BP big screens so the, these live relay broadcasts across the country and again by BP sticking its name on it it kind of gave this impression that BP was sort of paying for the whole thing and um, you know again that that way of really promoting its brand identity with the artwork but that offered a really lovely kind of forum for creative activists um, to go into those spaces. There were musicians from Extinction Rebellion one time, there were people from Art Not Oil who went into Trafalgar Square, there were dance-based protests. So people really using these kind of whole range of creative tactics to disrupt, engage, provoke conversation in, in quite imaginative ways. And that really ramped up the pressure. And then at the same time, some of the work that uh, I was doing with, with Culture and State was getting uh, composers and musicians who were really passionate about climate and the environment to kind of back letters um, to kind of raise these concerns on social media and really put that pressure on, on the management and leadership of the Royal Opera House as well. Um, and I, I guess one thing to mention is one of the board members of the Royal Opera House is the former CEO of BP, John Brown. So again, that's why it was like when when we finally found out about this, we were like, okay, this this is quite a significant shift here because again, though, you often get these kind of, um, yeah, individuals from leading corporations sort of on the boards of these institutions. Um, he, he used to be the chair of trustees at Tate as well when it was sponsored by BP as well. So the, the rule of these kind of interconnections behind the scenes as well. So yeah, it was a re really significant win, really significant shift. And it came almost a year to the day after the National Portrait Gallery and announced it was ending its BP sponsorship as well. So it's really seemed the domino start to fall. And so in relation to those dominoes and uh, the kind of swathe of cultural institutions that you're targeting at the moment, what other institutions are you uh, seeking to get to end their ties at the moment? So since 2016, there have been 14 kind of major cultural institutions that have cut their ties to fossil fuel sponsorship. So some of the ones I've mentioned, but also the South Bank Centre, British Film Institute, National Theatre, National Gallery, National Gallery Scotland. Again, it's a growing uh, list, but we still have um, this kind of odd situation at the British Museum right now, which is that on paper, according to their sponsorship contract, their five year sponsorship deal with BP ended in February, but the logo is still on their website and um, when approached they are just saying we have a partnership with BP that runs until this year so they're currently staying tight-lipped and not saying anything. Uh, either this means they're trying to stage manage the whole thing so it doesn't kind of 
give the activists and all the campaigners and all of the people who've been a part of that campaign the win that they've been working really hard to get, or they've signed up to some kind of new partnership with BP. So that's one of the main ones. And the, the other one being the Science Museum, um, which maybe people have seen or, or witnessed some of the controversy around it because they've got relationships with BP and Shell and Equinor, and then most recently Adani, which is this major Indian conglomerate which has huge investments in coal. Um, that was controversial enough in itself, but very recently there's been this major report from um, Hindenburg, who basically have exposed um, examples of fraud and mismanagement. And I guess crucially for us is that the Science Museum is saying, oh, we're not taking sponsorship from Adani um, as a whole, we're just taking it from this bit of the company, Adani Green Energy, which is involved in renewable energy. Um, but what this report has drawn attention to is actually that company is being used to kind of generate um, investment and funds, and those funds are potentially being channeled to the Carmichael coal mine in Australia as well. So there is not this separation between these parts of Adani. Adani is a fossil fuel producer. Um, it is building coal-fired power stations as well. Um, so yeah, this is a very effective way of Adani trying to present itself as a green company and, and then through this sponsorship deal with the Science Museum, again, trying to, you know, textbook form of greenwash, basically. And so finally then, for our viewers watching, um, how can they get involved in these campaigns? I guess there's a whole kind of range of ways. I think one of the most uh, kind of useful things right now is to be keeping the pressure on these cultural institutions, so both the British Museum and the Science Museum. Um, but there, I think also to keep an eye out on these other relationships, whether it's with sport teams, um, picture houses, cinemas have a partnership with INEOS, for example. Um, so to be challenging them in kind of creative and imaginative ways, whether that's just like in the social media spaces, whether that's by talking to the people that work in those spaces. And often we've found over the years that people who work in these sponsored institutions, they might not be comfortable with the sponsorships as well. So we've, we've had a really good relationship with the PCS union, for example, who um, represent front of house staff. So what are the alliances that we can build there? What are the creative ways we can use our activism to open up that space for conversation? Um, and yeah, I guess to be writing to these institutions to be challenging them um, in, in all of these different ways. Um, we've got this real opportunity to kind of maintain the pressure and I think really bring about a big shift um, in, in the cultural sector and really change the narrative if, if these two kind of major museums will finally kind of cut their ties to fossil fuel production as well. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Chris. I'll let you get on and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. It's been an absolute pleasure. Great, thank you for having me.